Hello. Hello. Hey. Everybody still awake or food yeah. comas yet? You know, from the organic, fancy, f fancy, smancy food and the olives and all that. Um, cool. So my name's Chris Larson, and welcome to the post meal kickoff, I guess, down here. I'm going to be talking about OpenTSV, which has been a, a long time part of the HBase community, ever since it was created by uh, Benoit Sgur, um, who was a former Googler. And he took some ideas from there um, when he went to StumbleUpon, created this open source time series database, and has been used pretty much. It's one of the example programs to use if you're going to turn up HBase. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Chris Larson again. I work at Yahoo now. Um, I'm lead maintainer. Uh, Benoit hasn't been able to commit much code lately. He's been really busy over at Arista um, doing some cool stuff there um, that doesn't involve time series data necessarily. Um, I'm a software engineer there at Yahoo, and I work on the monitoring team. Um, so our group is responsible for monitoring all of Yahoo's properties, um, all the ones that are internally uh, created or the ones that have been acquired and whatever happens to Yahoo in the future. Eh, who knows? You know. So maybe in June I'll be looking for a job somewhere else, somewhere <laughs> somebody uses OpenTSV. Um, so what is TSV? It's a time series database. So it's designed for storing a lot of data. Um, previously we had things like Graphite and Ganglia, uh, RRD tools and things that are awesome for what they did. And they work really good at a local level. But once you start to need scale, those guys don't scale very well. So this was uh, built to scale on top of HBase. Um, the idea is to suck up all of your data and store it forever. At least that was the di idea initially. Uh, nowadays, you can use TTLs to get rid of some of that data if you don't need it forever and ever, um, which we don't at Yahoo, and a lot of people don't. Um, it never loses precision. So if you're used to RRD tool files, you set up a uh, how frequent you expect your data to be coming in. And then whenever a data point comes in, it's going to be interpolated and snapped to a different point in time unless it's on an exact boundary. And the value may be interpolated and changed, too. TSV doesn't do that. Uh, Open TSV scales on top of HBase. And if you've been here the last three years or so that we've done this presentation, pretty much the same slides to start off with here. Uh, but now we have Cassandra tell anybody. And Big Table, which is cool. They're actually upstairs. Um, what's it good for? System measurements, of course, uh, servers, networks. A lot of people here are um, working at tech companies, so you're going to be using TSB for monitoring your stuff, your applications. But you can also use it for sensor data, of course. Um, some folks at Lockheed are looking at it. Uh, some other companies use it for scientific measurements. Um, anything that spits out a number and a timestamp, you can pretty much store. Um, just some use cases. If you went to the talk earlier, um, the folks at Salesforce here, Tom and his team, built Argus uh, for monitoring systems, um, their infrastructure. And they added a lot of missing features that TSB doesn't support, because it's primarily focused on just the data points. Uh, but they added monitoring alerting, um, dashboarding, all of that kind of stuff on top of it. Um, so this is just some information about what they're doing, what uh, some of their latencies are. Like they're getting 200 milliseconds, uh, 95th percentile, for queries of data less than 30 days, which is really pretty impressive. Um, and they're moving and growing their clusters too, to write up to 100 million data points a minute. Um, and they may be moving to Phoenix, too, off of TSV. So there are plenty of options for Argus as an underlying data store. Um, over at Yahoo, like I said, I work on the monitoring team. So we're grabbing all the data from everywhere, Tumblr, Flickr, Mail. And that's a crap load of data. Uh, so we've got about 10 million data points per second coming into our system. And it's a single uh, HBase cluster. We actually have two of them just for redundancy, but we have about 110 region servers there. Um, and if you heard Francis Liu talk about HBase this morning um, and the multi-tenancy, that's what we're running on top of. Um, so we have a, a carved chunk of this multi-tenant HBase uh, set up just for us. Um, right now, our TSB writers average about 200,000 writes per second on an eight-core VM. 
um, which is pretty good. I've pushed that up to about 300,000 data points per second. Um, and that's all using the uh, async HBase and OpenTSB library um, with this setup. And we have uh, Kerberos security in our Yahoo uh, cluster as well. Some other companies that have been using TSB for a while, uh, Bloomberg's uh, playing around with it right now. Ticketmaster has used it for a while. Tumblr, Cores, eBay, companies like that. So it's out there. It's been around forever. Um, again, this is kind of recap from past years. Uh, but real quick, what is a time series? Um, it's a number of data points associated with a specific identity over time. So you give me a value, and you give me a timestamp, and you give me an identifier. That's going to be a data point, and then you give me a bunch of those, there's a time series. So in TSV lingo, we only have a metric um, idea. Um, in the next version of TSV, we're going to be including namespaces, um, probably scope similar to what Argus does, so that'll make things a little more flexible. Um, and then we have the idea of tags, um, which are used for filtering and further describing and slicing your data. Like I said, a data point. Just an identifier, a value, and a timestamp. And so if you look at this, you've got the metric, a timestamp, a value 42, and then some tags. How TSB works, it's pretty simple. Uh, you just turn up your HBase cluster, and then you install some TSB daemons wherever you want, and you point them at HBase, specifically at HBase and Zookeeper, and you're up and running. And that's it. You don't have to worry about any more infrastructure. Um, all you have to worry about is making sure it can communicate with Zookeeper and HBase, and you're good to go. You can scale out by adding more daemons if you need more read load or uh, more write capacity. Um, and you just scale out HBase underneath it as you need to. So no shared infrastructure or anything like that other than Zookeeper and HBase. Uh, to write data, if you want to get started, all you have to do, open up a Telnet socket if you want, write put and then your string metric name, timestamp, value, and tags, and that's it. You don't have to create a schema. You don't have to do, worry about any of that. No, you do have to create an HBase table, but after that, you don't have to worry about setting up a metric or a, a schema for each time series like you do in RRD or Graphite, um, all that kind of stuff. Alternatively, you can write over JSON using a RESTful API. Or you can import files from the CLI, gzip files, if you need to do a bulk importing. Um, and also later on, we're going to be adding more RPCs, and I'll talk about that in a bit, um, ways to write in. Uh, if you want to get data back out, which would be a pretty stupid database if you did just wrote data in and you didn't try to read it, right? I mean, what's the point then? Well, I guess you could like exercise some hard drives and CPUs and stuff, but that'd be silly. Um, you can graph it with a built-in, amazingly beautiful UI that creates these GNU plot graphs that I'm sure a lot of people have seen before. Hasn't changed. It's about the same. Uh, OpenTSV 2.2 has some pretty new colors, but it's still the same old thing. It works for getting up and running, doing quick ad hoc queries. If you want to save something, send a link to a friend or a coworker, then that's what it's good for. Otherwise, there are some CLI tools, of course. There's the RESTful API. Um, and you can fetch data out that way if you want. Um, in the future, we'll add some more. Uh, I'll get to that, too. Um, and at query time, one of the big differences uh, for OpenTSV than other systems is that it was designed from the get-go to make it efficient to aggregate a lot of time series into one. So let's say you're measuring um, the CPU user time on all of your hosts, and you've got a web server farm of maybe a thousand different machines, and you want to get the average CPU across those. That's what TSV is built to do. You just say, average my CPU user, don't supply any uh, tags, or supply maybe a host group and say web servers, and then it's going to aggregate all that data for you on the fly. It's not aggregated in storage, but it's on the fly and give it back to you. Um, so in HBase, there are a few data tables. You've got the one main big giant data point table that everything's written to. Then you have a UID table. Um, the reason the UID table is there is for spatial efficiency. Um, so if you have massive metric names, or like uh, namespace group dot host name dot 
CPU, dot blah, 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 blah. Or you have gigantic tags in, at Yahoo. Unfortunately, we've seen people compress the entire DOM for a web page into a tag and store it. And we go and slap those guys and say, this is silly. But they do it. You don't want to store that string multiple times in HBase, because that's going to eat up a lot of space in your row key. So we convert everything into numeric UIDs. So that, on the pro side, saves a lot of space. But on the bad side, that means that there's a set finite limit of UIDs um, that you can pull from. And initially, TSV, as um, uh, Tom pointed out in the Argus talk, it's limited to three bytes. So you've got 16 million. But a lot of people, before they deploy, they'll upgrade that uh, UID size. So you can go up to eight bytes. And if you exhaust eight bytes um, before you exhaust HBase and the technology, then I'd be really surprised. And I'd like to know what you did to exhaust those. So please tell me. Um, so the schema, um, Tom went over a little bit, uh, same thing uh, that Argus uses. Um, the row key is going to be the metric UID, the timestamp uh, aligned to a one hour boundary, then tag key, tag value, um, UID combinations. And that's so that everything, because HBase is sorted, of course, in order, if you want to fetch the metric, but you don't know which host you want to fetch it for, or what other kind of uh, tags you want to hedge, uh, fetch it for, we can do a scan in HBase across all those values for your time range and fetch all that data pretty quickly. Um, so this schema is pretty good, for again, for aggregations. Uh, the downside, though, is that if you have super high cardinality for your metrics, picking out little bits and pieces can be pretty slow. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second, too. Um, so OpenTSV 2.0, we finally cut an official release in February this year. Woohoo! No applause? That's funny. Um, so some of the features that we talked about at last HBaseCon um, that made it into this release include append writes. Um, one thing that TSV did before, if you get a data point, it's going to write a column. New data point, new column in HBase. Cool. But there's overhead with each column, right? There's the timestamps. Um, other uh, associated data that's stored in the index, uh, Bloom filter, and all that fun stuff. Um, so TSV used to go through, and at the end of an hour, it would read out all of those rows, bring them back into a TSV daemon somewhere, compact them into one column, put those back, that column back, and delete the old stuff. Cool, safe space, but thrashes the heck out of your HBase servers and your network, because you're bringing all that data back in and out. So a lot of people, when you, they first turn, uh, try out TSB, they look in there and like, what's going on? Every hour, my HBase server is slow to a crawl. And then they turn off um, the compactions, and then uh, read or query latency decreases a tiny bit, um, because now you're fetching out all that extraneous meta, uh, metadata that we don't need. Um, so Yahoo added the ability to append data using the append API in HBase, where we just concatenate everything into a single column, get rid of that extra uh, data, and it works pretty good. Um, the only downside is that it does use uh, more resources on the region server, because internally it still has to do the read modifier write um, ultimately, so you have to watch out for that. Um, we added row salting. Everybody does that. We do uh, random IDs, too, if you want to turn it on. And that helps distribute the write load a ton. Um, we added some other little features around query filters um, with wildcard and regex now. Uh, people didn't want to group by stuff, so that's been uh, fixed. Um, we've got a storage plugin, uh, exception plugin. So if HBase is down for some reason, you can still feed data points to uh, your TSDs and then queue them to disk or write them back to a queuing system. Kafka is pretty popular. We use Kafka uh, at Yahoo in our pipeline. So we just, um, anytime there's a rolling upgrade or we can't write, we put it back in there. 2.3, um, we have a new committer now, Jonathan Creasy, formerly at, I think, Box and Turn. Um, he's helping out now. Um, we cut a first release candidate not long ago. Some bugs in it, of course. Um, and I bet there are more bugs, so help us find them. Uh, post uh, GitHub issues, please, and we'll fix them up. Or if you can help fix them, that'd be awesome, too. Um, but we added from turn a, a few graphite-style functions um, to, get it, uh, to make it a little more easy to switch between the two. 
Um, cross metric expressions that uh, we started work on, that's kind of uh, an embryonic stage. It's not perfect. Um, 3.0 is going to look a lot better, I think. Uh, calendar based downsampling, um, some new data stores that we're going to talk about, um, some filters. It's really important, and we found out at Yahoo that if you give everybody access to your system, they were going to abuse it. Pretty common when you're running something as a service. So like I said about that uh, group that compressed the DOM into a tag, that's just silly. Uh, we added some filter plugins that will let us prevent that kind of abuse. Um, so the interfaces are here. Uh, we don't necessarily have any uh, plugins open source yet, but we're working on getting those upstream too. Um, so one feature I want to talk about in uh, 2.3, or it may have made it in 2.2. No, I think it's 2.3 actually. Uh, another company brought it up. It's called the Fuzzy Row Filter, and it's a neat HBase uh, filter, and it's a trick that we've been using and took advantage of at Yahoo. Um, so when you query for or do a scan for a particular metric, and let's say you have one tag that you're looking for, but your time series has a whole bunch of tags, um, and you want to pull that out. And so what TSB does under the hood is craft a row key regex filter, um, with uh, binary values, because all of our UIDs are binary, and it's going to pass that filter over to the region server, and the region server is going to iterate over all the cells in order and pull out the ones that satisfy that filter. So this will help um, filter out everything you don't need, and it works, um, but it can be pretty slow. So I took this uh, measurement from one of our real use case um, series where we had a cardinality of 89,000 um, different time series. And to run this regex across all of those, and this is actually across 20 different region servers because we have salting enabled, the same uh, Roki filter, it took about 1.6 seconds to satisfy this query. So that's pretty crappy, right? It's not going to make anybody happy. It's not going to make them a fan of our Yahoo monitoring system. Um, and we do kind of want them to be a fan so that we get to stick around in case we get new overlords at Yahoo. So we looked at the fuzzy row filter, and it turns out that this will utilize the skip scan functionality built into HBase, that if you craft a fuzzy mask and give that as the first filter to HBase, it's going to apply that mask, and the first time it finds something while it's scanning that doesn't satisfy the mask, it's going to use the bloom filter to find and skip to the next row that should satisfy that mask. So applying this along with the regex, because one um, drawback of this is that the fuzzy row is a byte mask filter, not a bit mask filter. Um, applying this, it answered our query in about 239 milliseconds instead of 1.6 seconds. So that definitely helped us out. So the fuzzy f uh, row filter, some pros are that it can, in a certain number of situations improve your scan latency by orders of magnitude. Um, also, you can combine it with other filters. So you can build a complex uh, filter list in HBase. Um, but some drawbacks are that all of your keys to, that match the fuzzy filter have to be the exact same length. So you can't have arbitrary width uh, uh, fields. If you do have a lot of tags that are, or um, row keys that are different lengths, it's going to skip it. So that's kind of a good thing. Um, it doesn't help when you're matching the majority of a set, because in that case, it's just going to be working over another filter, just another operation for the CPU or the uh, region server to run through. So if you know you're going to fetch out everything in a, a group, like if you just get the metric name or something, then you don't want to apply the fuzzy filter. And like I said, it doesn't apply a bit mass right now. So. I'll have to ask the HBase developers, like Stack and everybody, if there's a way to implement bit scanning as a bit mask, because we can, at that point, then use our UIDs to filter out more stuff um, in our rows. Unfortunately, right now, it'll match or not match the entire UID. So another drawback is that if all of your time series are the same length and they have the same key but different values, so a super high cardinality, like let's say you have 10,000 hosts, and that's all you have for that metric, then it may not help very much. Uh, it's, it's still going to iterate over those rows. 
So fuzzy filter is a cool thing. If you're writing HBase applications and you're working directly against it and not using something like Phoenix um, as an arbitrator for your data, then take a look at it. It's pretty cool. Um, so async HBase is an alternative HBase client that OpenTSV uses um, that was started by Benoit, um, and a lot of people have been using it outside of OpenTSV, too. Um, so it's out there for anybody to use. It has some benefits in that it's fully asynchronous, multi-threaded, um, supports HBase from 0.90 all the way up to the latest version. You don't have to compile in the exact version from um, the Java release uh, or the Hadoop release to match your HBase version. You can still, you can upgrade HBase and not have to touch your client code at all. So it's kind of cool from that uh, standpoint. It can be, not always, but it can be faster, um, and it generally is less resource intensive than the native HBase client. Um, and it doesn't support all of HBase client's functions, but it does support some of them, like some basic filters, um, supports some meta uh, mail prefetch, or meta prefetching to bootstrap your clients. Um, also supports fail fast RPCs. Um, so this year I finally got to poking around at comparing HBase uh, or the HBase client versus async HBase and got to submit a PR against YCSB, the Yahoo Cloud Serving Benchmark, which isn't really worked on at Yahoo much. Um, now it's worked on mostly by Googlers, so go figure that out. Um, but it's now been committed uh, to YCSB, so if you want to play around with uh, async HBase versus HTable, or whatever it's properly called, sorry, you can go ahead and do that. So I ran some tests here, and I've got some neat graphs. Pretty much there's just one thread run on my MacBook um, against local HBase, default vanilla HBase pulled from uh, Apache. Um, nothing special. And one of the things that stands out most is the thread count. Um, so I know some work has been going on in the, the main HTable client to get the thread count down, but in this example, we've got the HTable client was running consistently about 238 threads. Async HBase ran 22 in total. Um, and then the GC count for the load time, this was a load graph, I believe, was generally a lot lower as well. Um, I think uh, GC count is on the right-hand side for the H table is around 40 counts per run, um, and for async is about 10 counts per run. Load throughput, async H base did a little better than H table, not uh, gigantically better, but it does do better. It does batch processing by default. Um, in that you write your RPC, your put um, RPC to your async HBase client. It's going to um, queue it up for either one second or until its internal buffer is full, and then it's going to flush it off to the region server using whichever thread did the write, that RPC. So this is a great way to batch things up. Um, there's also a similar behavior in HTable where you have the buffered mutator. Um, so that's what this uh, compares uh, async HBase against. So that was good news for async HBase. On the right, uh, read side, though, they're about the same. Um, this could be attributed partly to uh, the number of threads that the HTable client spins up. It's going to read out um, about the same rate as uh, uh, async HBase. And async HBase was running synchronously here as well. Um, similar to the HTable client, so they're about one-to-one -one there. Um, one other thing to note about the async HBase client is that if you're running a lot of read-heavy workload with a lot of region servers, there can be a bottleneck there due to its asynchronous nature. Um, because on startup, the async HBase client is going to create uh, two threads for the region servers um, per CPU core that you've got. So if you have an 8-core VM, it's going to create 16 threads to interact with HBase. So if you have 16 HBase servers, cool. You're going to have one thread per HBase server. But if you have 32 HBase servers, you're going to have two servers per thread then coming back. right? Um, so there's going to be some contention there. On write loads, it generally does matter. On read loads, it can matter. So in some read situations, you might want to look at using the HTable client. For writes, you might want to look at async HBase. 
So there's, there's some trade-offs there. Um, interestingly, I didn't include it here, but I looked at the scan time, too, um, in YCSB, and it was much worse for async HBase, um, primarily due to it keeping a lot more data in memory for some reason. So my next bug fix for myself is to figure out what's happening there, why the scans took longer, because they should be about similar. It may have to do with cell to key value conversion and all that kind of stuff. I've got to look at that. Um, so some features are upcoming. Uh, 1.7 was released this year for Async HBase. Uh, 1.8 uh, that we're working on, we're going to get, we did commit the reverse scanning patch somebody supplied. Um, we're also going to be working on multi-gets. Um, we need that desperately at Yahoo uh, to help with that cardinality problem for situations where the fuzzy row filter won't help us out. Um, so we're working on that. We'll upgrade in Netty 4. Um, some bug fixes that we've got in-house that haven't upstreamed yet around uh, stuck in SREs um, in region client resources. And there are a few other things I don't want to talk about yet because I'm not sure if I'm proud about them, proud of them yet, and we'll fix them. Another new development. Um, of course, everybody probably saw the table upstairs. Uh, Google open sourced, or if you want to talk before, uh, big table. Well, they didn't open source it, but they're offering it as a service. So in this case, OpenTSV is kind of coming home in that uh, we worked with uh, the Pythion um, uh, consulting firm and the Bigtable team at uh, Google to make sure OpenTSV runs on it. And we have a few people already using TSV on top of it. Um, the great things about it are that the Bigtable interface, HBase API. So you'd take the HTable client. Um, you just say, hey, I want to use Bigtable, type in your creds. You can start writing to Bigtable. So to make OpenTSB work on this, it was pretty easy in that Bigtable supports the same schema, similar um, filters. Doesn't support the uh, fuzzy filter yet. I think I say that. That's coming in anyways. Um, but we created async Bigtable. Uh, the fellows, uh, Christos there over at Pythion did that. Um, and so it implements the async HBase API, kind of like HTable um, did for Bigtable, or Bigtable implemented HTable API. And it's a drop in for um, OpenTSB. So you just say, instead of async HBase, use this guy, and you can start writing. Um, so I want to shout out uh, thanks to all the, the Google team, Solomon Carter, Misha, and the rest, um, and then Christos there at Pythian for doing all the work, the hard work. Um, another note is that people have been clamoring uh, on the message boards about Cassandra support because they think Cassandra is a lot easier to set up. And sure, it's easy to set it up, but to run it long term, I don't know. Um, haven't played with it much. Uh, but we did kind of just for fun slap together uh, implementation of a Cassandra client um, that implements the async HBase interface um, using the SDNX library. Um, and because Cassandra started off almost identical as far as uh, uh, HBase's internals and that it had uh, a big table with row keys and columns and all of that, we could use this byte-ordered partition to make sure everything is sorted and write identically to it. Um, the problem is that it looks like in newer versions of Cassandra, they're going away from that and making you use C CSQL all the time for interfacing with it. So if they get rid of it, and people are interested, maybe we'll look at um, fixing this up to work better. Um, as far as performance goes, I played with it, uh, just a single VM and a two node v, uh, Cassandra cluster, and it worked pretty good. It was good at writing. Um, it was decent at reading. The bad thing, though, is that with this uh, default kind of um, layout that Cassandra implements, they don't have any filter support like HBase does. So if you want to do any filtering, you have to bring all that crap back from storage, filter it on your client, and then decide what you want to keep. So that's something to watch out for. Um, some updates on the community. Of course, the Argus team uh, released Argus, time series monitoring. Thanks to those guys for their talk and for working on it. And oops, goofed up the graphic there. If you want to read the post, here's a link to uh, Tom's post about Argus and how it works. Um, also, the guys at Turn, one of the drawbacks in TSV right now is that it doesn't have a great query uh, tier in that if you issue a query, it goes to one TSD, 
that one TSD has to do all of the work. So the folks at TURN built a quick little um, application on top of it that will splice those queries, shard them out to multiple TSDs, and bring them back. So thanks to Jonathan Creasy and the TURN engineers for that. You can find that on GitHub, too, if you want to play around with it. And then real quick about the future of TSDB. So um, this is something I started on just now that's been a long time coming, um, is to rework the query pipeline um, for selective ordering of operations. Um, right now, the order of operations, like group by, downsampling, rate calculations, all that's fixed in TSDB. Makes it fast, but also makes it inflexible. So, um, I've finally gotten some of the APIs written, and we've got some work um, on our team at Yahoo implementing this. So we're going to add streaming support at the same time, where you can actually use the REST API or something else to chunk requests into your, or send your query to TSB, and then get the data out in chunks, so that if you have a massive query and you want to query the world, you can use it kind of Splunk style and get little bits of data back at a time without ooming all of your TSDBs and region servers. Um, so that's looking pretty good. One of the backing implementations we're using for it or trying out right now is uh, Google's gRPC with HTTP2, and that's looking very promising. And it looks like a really cool technology um, with proto, uh, protobus support. Another thing that um, is due actually by Q3 internally at Yahoo is histogram support, where you can write from your host an actual full entire histogram bucketed and fine, stored in HBase um, in OpenTSV, and then query over that and perform aggregations on it. So that's something that uh, a time series database like Druid does natively, which is pretty cool. Um, but one of our um, main uh, selling points is that we're a lot resource, a lot cheaper and less resource intensive than Druid. So that's why TSB is an ongoing concern at Yahoo. Um, another thing, flexible querying caching framework. So we have an, just the rudiments of an in-house query layer that does uh, time sharding across different buckets. So you're only fex, uh, fetching the tip data as you need it when querying. Um, and we're also working on the distributed queries too aside from Splicer, um, but may take in some of the concept, concepts from Splicer and all that Splicer. Um, and then also working on a greater data, uh, greater data store abstraction layer, um, because we're looking forward to some new technologies might be coming out, like uh, Facebook has this really cool in-memory time series store called Gorilla that hopefully they're going to be um, open sourcing, and we might be able to leverage that as a front end um, for some caching or something like that. Um, so I want to say thanks to everybody who contributed to OpenTSV 2.0 and 2.3 and working on what's going to become uh, 3.0. There might be a 2.4 release and all of that too. Um, and if you want to contribute or have any questions about TSV, you can go there.